Hello everybody, it's Peter. Peter with an I, S-T-A-W-A-R-T. And welcome to segment 42 of... I don't know, the Dark Tower, I guess? Their thoughts were focused on the mission that laid ahead of them at the hospital on the hill, the Brownstone. But they couldn't help but take an account of how creepy their surroundings were. Olive green Spanish moss hung down from the arms of branches, like once beautiful hair that had been savaged by decay. The dried skeleton of a failed vine maple scratched against their legs like fingernails, and dew-soaked leaves licked their arms. Joe, who found himself trailing behind the others, was aware of how much noise they were making just by walking. He wasn't afraid someone out by the road would hear them. He was afraid of waking up the boogeyman. <laughs> Sound has a funny way of playing tricks out in the woods at night. One step through the leaves can sound like two, and the crack of a bush can sound like it was made from a distance. He caught up to Nancy and held the back of her pack. Both Nancy and Joe had seen how Frank had a habit of going berserk when faced with the confrontation and felt a little bit better he was around, but Frank wasn't at all confident. He knew that if he were faced with anything macabre or supernatural, he would be as defenseless as a baby. Frank's movements were mechanical and stiff because he had freaked himself out so badly by letting his mind wander like an innocent child into the dark catacombs of fear. Remember that one story? Cradle in the Eaves? asked Joe. Dude! pleaded Frank. Please shut up! He really didn't need Joe digging up mental rot like that at that particular time. The Cradle in the Eaves was one of the most horrifying stories each of them had ever heard. Nancy was getting a kick out of Frank's pure dread. Remember, continued Joe. Shut up demanded Frank. Just shut up. <laughs> no, just listen, said Joe with a chuckle. No, I won't just listen, he said, raising his voice. Now shut up! <laughs> After a moment of silence, Nancy uttered a high-pitched it was like she took an icy cold electrified finger that vibrated and poked it into the side of Frank's neck. The high-pitched sound Nancy was making was in reference to one of the scariest parts in the story. The scraping on the glass next to the boy's bed at night. In the story, the boy who was responsible for leaving the cradle under the eaves next to the hornet's nest assumed the sound was made by branches scraping up against the outside of his bedroom window. But in the morning, he was reminded that the suspected bush had been taken out because it had the hornet's nest in it. And how about the banshee, said Joe, kitty from delight at baiting poor Frank. Now I like that one, he said. That was the one where the gardener who worked at this old mansion kept seeing a person in a white evening gown wandering around the foggy grounds at night. Finally. When the gardener decided to dig a hole to put in a post for a croquet course, the first scoop provided him with a shovel full of evidence that the land baron's mistress hadn't run away like everyone had assumed. Why in heaven's name Frank liked that story is a question for the child psychologists. Maybe he liked it because it wasn't as scary as Cradle in the Eaves. Spanish moss that hung from the palm-shaped trunk of a maple tree brushed over Joe's face, but he was too preoccupied trying to think of another story they could tease Frank with. They made it to the cyclone-sheltered passageway, and they put on their fake mustaches, which made them look like they should be jumping over burning barrels on their way to save the princess. Even though the tape that recorded everything from the night before was a grainy black and white, any security staff member with a keen eye could see through the kids' camouflage, but they would need to view the footage at normal speed and wouldn't be able to see anything if they played it in fast forward. It was only a day after last night's reconnaissance mission, 
and there was no way anybody could watch every hour of the previous night without dying of boredom. Nancy hadn't heard of any staff members dying at the clinic that day, so nobody must have watched the tape. Therefore, the dentist couldn't be sure if the infiltrators had broken in during the night, or if it was an inside job, or even if the tile had been stolen at all. He could have assumed it was misplaced. They say that Stalin would execute members of his staff because he was absolutely positive they stole his secret files. But then he would feel embarrassed because he himself had accidentally misplaced them. Before he started ordering executions, his secretary would always ask, Did you leave it in the bathroom? Is it on top of the washing machine? Retrace your steps and picture every room you were in this morning before you have anybody killed. Nancy had a pretty good idea of which surveillance cameras were aimed where, but she had everybody bring along fake mustaches, just in case they had repositioned any of them. They only needed the mustaches because the terrible quality of the recycled tapes made identifying anyone nearly impossible unless they stood directly in front of the camera and stated their full name. If anyone were to look at the surveillance footage of the three walking toward the building with those mustaches, they might be tempted to question chefs working at the local pizzeria. Hey. But that would be the extent of the investigation. The kids made their way inside. As they walked, Frank picked a long hair off Joe's back and studied it. It certainly didn't come off any of them. It was long and black, with split ends. He shrugged and threw it to the side. The security guard, who was told to keep an eye out on the monitors, watched the cleaning crew mopping the floors. Ordinarily, it would be great if security guards were always at the height of their diligence, but security guard Lewis was ordered to mellow out after he came around a corner one night and shot the head off a cardboard cutout, depicting an old man with his arm around the shoulder of a young girl who was left standing there smiling at her headless grandpa. The cleaning crew sidestepped as they mopped their way across the main lobby. Inside the elevators, they could be seen spraying the walls with disinfectant and rubbing them down. Soon the cleaning crew were at the top floor. They went into the dentist's office, where he had his own surveillance cameras. The security guard rested, assured that if there were any prowlers that night, the cleaning crew, which looked like they had just stepped off the gondola boats, would spin them on their knuckles, like a they was a pizza pie. Hey. Once inside the office, Nancy, Frank, and Joe went into the bathroom, where no surveillance cameras were allowed, and put on their Halloween masks. They were ornately molded latex ones, and their quality made them really scary. They taped the aluminum triangles they had cut from cola cans and spray-painted black onto the ends of their fingers, producing menacing claws. When they came out, Nancy and Joe were transformed into awful-looking ghouls. And they danced an evil dance. Frank looked like he had gone to the beauty salon and a nacelle hairdryer cone malfunctioned clamped down onto his shoulders, and the flames started whooshing around like a washing machine full of rocket fuel, giving him a face liftoff. Nancy, Frank, and Joe moved in wicked ways, shaking and twisting. Nancy carried around a used bandage, which had a fresh, juicy scab on it. Part of Frank's dance included picking his nose and waving it in the air like kelp brushed by the sea. Joe blew hot, wicked winds through his trousers. It was a horrible sight and smell. Earlier that day, Nancy overheard that the dentist was bringing in clairvoyance to come into the office where the theft had occurred so that they could see the past with their diamond eyes. The kids were going in that night to give the place a bad shining. Their bad voodoo would terrify the seers of truth and debunk the sayers of sooth. While they were doing the monster mash, which was a graveyard smash, the dentist stepped around the corner. It was something completely unexpected. 